right, here's a Q&A for every army in 16 minutes. I'm Heiwo, let's plow ahead. Will I keep doing faction-focused videos? Yes. I just wanted to get out a fast, easy, click-and-watch rundown of every army, so it was out there as a resource. Obviously, I had to skip stuff, even important stuff, like mostly what your spell lords do, underrepresented, alternative builds, etc. But when armies have like 28 seconds to speak, you gotta go big picture. Deep dives are where we can kick our feet up a bit. What makes an effective list? Man, I could do a whole show on this, but as a new player, Q&A, this one's probably important, so here's a TLDR. In Age of Sigmar, we tend to build army lists first and foremost to try to win on the majority of battle plans that we can. And only after that do we start tinkering with choices and options with certain particular army matchups in mind. There's no rule in AOS that you win if you table the enemy. It's all about objectives and points. So this is why many factions appear solved from an outside perspective, and the only differences are tweaks akin to sideboarding and Magic the Gathering, based on what you're weak to or expect to play against a lot. Units with high movement and on-the-table teleports or bonus movement spells are very important. An anvil or two is nice to farm objectives. Hammers are good, but a hammer that can't get where it needs to go is often useless. I've beaten many old Stormcast armies by just not engaging their glacially slow paladins for a few turns while I collected victory points. Shooting can be strong, but don't try to force it if they aren't great. You can end up with a bunch of wet paper bags. Chaff is important if you're the kind of army that needs it, and most armies need it. Mortal Wounds, if you have a unit good at doing them, play it. You need an answer to your problems. Some armies don't have that, and if they don't have that, usually they have a lot of Ren 2, so play that instead. If you don't have either of them, you usually have other tools to try to win anyway. And in GHB 2020, we got bonus points for certain types of units, like battle line or monsters or heroes, so check out what they are and try to play a decent spread of them. If you can, you don't have to force it. We're also seeing a lot more objectives on the battlefield, up to 8, so giant Death Stars where your whole army is 2 killer hammers supported by a thousand points of buff heroes, you might have some trouble spreading out. Does underdog mean bad? If you're going to a 5 round tournament and you intend to win the trophy, yes, of course. I'd consider 3 and 2 a big success. This might surprise people online, but most players that go to big events are just shooting for a 3-2 and two and are happy to play 5 games in a row, and hang out with people who like Age of Sigmar, hit up the bar, take pictures of cool armies, talk to people, and often raise money for charity. For the most part, that's the 2-day tournament scene. For local games, remember that this is Age of Sigmar, so the majority of people are on random crap. And even powerful army random crap can be worse than optimized underdog. Sometimes much worse. For a small 3 round event, you can randomly grab top 3 with an underdog army if you're lucky, since 3 and 2 is possible at a 5 rounder. Your first few rounds can have very favorable matchups just by luck after all. What does Lumineth Sentinels being Shroud mean? Is it bad? Shroud is a former CSGO pro who retired to streaming and his reaction into headshot timing is completely ridiculous. So this means Sentinels are good sniper units. What does Castle Army mean? Is it defensive? Yes and no. I'd say defensive deployment at least. They tend to be armies with lots of great options for most roles you could want, with good combos that often have strong magic and or shooting components. And like a castle, they deploy in one or two long blobs with big walls of chaff around their important stuff. They hate it when Alpha Strike starts smashing their toys right away, but if you let them get up and running for a turn, they become dominating and can safely toss scissors at your paper until you lose. Examples are Skaven, Cities of Sigmar, Seraphon, and Zinch. OBR only at good and not powerful? I don't understand, they're top three. Well, they were right when they came out on pure statistics, but then we stopped getting proper events for the rest of the year due to COVID. And playing against them even at the time, I thought they were overrated. I felt like they did what Fire Slayers do only worse, but look good doing it, so a big percentage of people played them, and nobody plays Fire Slayers, so OBR got the headlines. One of OBR's strengths as an army is also one of its weaknesses. It will crush its good matchups, but be generally helpless against its bad ones, and more so than your average AOS army. If your opponent is trying to outplay you on objectives by leveraging your big downsides of slow and elite, it's either a 50-50 proper game or OBR has no chance. As the Bone Boys player, this is a concern when bad matchup armies like KO, Seraphon, and Lumineth keep coming out, plus Petrifex lost its defense. Equal skill tier list, I'd put them maybe 10th or a little lower at the moment, but they'll always have those free wins when facing opponents who don't have shooting or mortal wounds. I just can't in good conscience put an army, even one with strong offense and defense, in the powerful category when it's so weak on battle plan play. However, if you're the kind of player who finds tallying up objective points boring and just wants a terminator meat grinder where you end up tabling the opponent but might still lose, that's OBR.
How do you rate Legion of Grief? For those that don't know, this is a two-page alternative Night Haunt plus Legion of Nagash mixture army from the Forbidden Power supplement. As of GHB 2020, using ancillary product army rules like these is technically a house rule you have to okay with your opponent, so its tournament legality is tenuous, which is why I didn't talk about it. Many TOs try to let people play with their toys, but who knows. LOG was way better than Night Hunt when it first came out. After losing Mortality Glass and Realm Artifacts, it's less clear-cut, but still maybe better depending on how you like to play. It trades the Deep Strikes, Battalions, and good Battle Line options of Night Haunt for a Necromancer to double pile in and the powerful Endless Legion's command ability that lets you return a slain unit fully to life from a gravesite if your general's alive and nearby. Problem, none of your available generals are remotely durable, so that alive part can be tricky. If it were me, I think I'd compromise on a Dreadblade Harrow at least to be able to teleport to a gravesite. Other downsides are its high drops, and Bravery Bomb playstyles don't do much of anything against maybe half the armies out there. It's a cool second way to play your Night Hunt army if you want to mix things up, and your opponent is cool with it. You can use all the same models, just buy one Necromancer for $15. Cheapest second army in the game. Deepkin armies just spam eels. Spam is a game-wide problem, especially for the brand new AOS armies with small ranges. Well, yes and no. Entirely new Age of Sigmar factions like OBR, KO, Night Haunt, Fire Slayers, seemingly Lumineth after reading their book once, these are reasonably not spammy. IDK is basically unique in this regard. Iron Jaws likes their Ard Boys, to be fair though. How much spam exists in the game as a whole is a byproduct of bad internal balance and way too many shit war scrolls and poor implementation of different unit roles is a topic for another video, however. Why do the worst models always have the strongest rules? Is that the case? This is certainly begging the question, but I wonder if it's true or if it's negativity bias. Let's find out, with the obvious caveat that we're getting into aesthetics opinions. Okay, I've returned. This is not the case in the great majority of factions. Notable exceptions are any army that can legally field marauders, but I blame GW's consistent inability to make strong big base battle line like Chaos Warriors or Blood Warriors, when compared to 40-man blobs of naked idiots due to how strong buff scaling is. Obviously, the entire faction of Idnet Deepkin could be a TED talk on how to make literally the only bad sculpts in a faction also the only playable ones while well, everything else is god-tier amazing looking and weak. Some of the factions that may be half-count, but it was probably at random, would be BOC and Seraphon. Both of them were filled with embarrassingly old and derpy-looking bad sculpts that should have been retired or replaced when AOS came out. It's kind of no wonder some of them are accidentally good. The rest of the complaints, I think, fall into the realm of half of the war scrolls in my battle tome are trash. Why do they have to do this? Some of them look cool. Here's hoping the next round of battle tomes, they try a little harder to make sure there's a game reason to buy each of your units. I'm paraphrasing this question from about 100 Facebook posts that I've seen over the course of the last year. Hi, I'm brand new to the game and I don't know anything about it, but I impulse purchased $400 of the absolute most useless units available to my faction, and I want to build a killer list that wins all the time. What should I add to it, and what lists are the best? I make videos so that you don't become this person. Rule of cool is totally fine, but you should expect to do some research if you also want to compete. This is another one of those problems that would be solved with better battle tomes. Can I play the Warcry Warbands? Technically yes, but man, I didn't want to be the one, but somebody has to tell you. They were added to AOS proper in such a way as to purposefully not interact with any of STD's important rules and be very bad. Maybe Iron Golems are okay as cheap chaff, but you'd still use Marauders. Why these weren't divvied up between all the different Chaos armies and given real rules, like, it's such a big wasted opportunity with such great looking models. But that's sort of a microcosm for why I wasn't happy with Warcry in general. It would have been way better as a skirmish AOS featuring very similar rules to the main game, like Kill Team was, which would have made it a great tool to help an interested player dip their foot in the pool without spending an arm and a leg, but instead it's a different game and it doesn't translate to AOS really at all. Shame. Is there a tier list for how easy it is to transport armies? I mean, there probably should be, right? Um, but this will just vary too much based on whatever list you happen to be running. Like, all skeleton death march LON can probably fit in a shoebox, but add in Nagash and suddenly it's rough to bring it on a plane. One thing is for sure, Sylvaneth and its entire extra box of Wildwoods to lug around is F tier. Hi, my question is about Gloomspite and how to play them in the new meta. Should be a quick answer. Yeah, I bet, but let's try anyway. 
Limit 3 and List Spells actually kind of hurts you, but I'd go Beowind, Scuttle Tide, and then Flex Slot of Geminids. Cauldron is more for other armies when they ally in a Fungoid. Arachnorok is probably off the menu, too easy to snipe. 3 or 6 Fellwater Trogoth are kind of nice for that last chunk of extra points to mix things up. Shooters still aren't worth it over Stabas. Losing Realm Artifacts really sucks for people like me who would refuse not to play arguably the best sculpt in AOS, which is Loom Boss on Mangler Squigs. It might be time to retire Scragrot, even though losing the command points is the hardest part, but I want those 220 points elsewhere in a command trait. That White Dwarf Squigglanch thing is actually sweet, super fun, and not bad competitively. Only downside is if it'll still be legal next year on account of that GHP 2020 thing. Also, and I know this is controversial, Trogoth Hag sucks. Which factions are small ranges but well-oiled machines, and which factions are small ranges but they feel they need more? Well-oiled machines but small ranges. Lumineth, OBR, Fire Slayers, Doc. I'm not saying Slayers couldn't do for a better ranged unit than Auric, and I'm not saying that all their guys looking and sounding the same isn't a problem, or that Doc doesn't have a variety issue, but they work. Small and limited range? FEC, big time. They are really hurting for an expansion, and especially an update to all their old derpy sculpts, which is every sculpt, and the army feels like the Ghoul King on Terrorgeist show featuring 1500 points of stuff you aren't happy with, which is why I would play two of them, but I'm just a Beast Claw player, what do I know? What is the acceptable number of eels? Well, you can make a reasonable underdog army that only runs like six of them. My list only has nine, plus Storm Eidolon and Lotan, and I tend to win my casual games. If only I ever had time to finish painting them instead of always choosing to make a video when I had free time. Who is Akshi? Why is Archeon? And where are the Tyrions of yesteryear? Alright, this is silly, but I can handle it. Akshi is the Fire Realm currently ruled by Chaos, and specifically Korn, so who is Akshi? I would say Korn. Why is Archeon? Archeon killed every champion each Chaos God sent, though Slaanesh didn't send one, so I suppose because victory and perseverance. Where are the Tyrions of yesteryear? On eBay. Unsold. What are the best armies to learn with for inexperienced and young gamers? What about inexperienced gamers who are new to war games? I don't know exactly the age group you're talking about here, but I'm going to assume that it's not super young. I'm going to throw you a curveball here, but it's one I believe in. Pick the most rewarding, difficult army to play. The game is not challenging to learn. After five in-person games, you basically have it down. Kids learn quick, at the time of their life when their brain is most absorptive to new stuff. You want that clear and rewarding feedback whenever they get better, or find out something new, and you want a nice amount of challenges and rough edges to keep them from getting bored. Don't drop them into Dark Souls or EverQuest without a map or anything, but I think you get my point. Bring them to your two-day events so they can feel like they're part of a cool group of adults that still have fun even though they're grown-ups. When they lose, talk about how it feels and what it means so they can have a positive attitude towards losing as part of the learning process and not grow up to be a salty dickhead. If they're one of those kids that gets good, the danger is there for getting a big head, so set an example of winning with grace. They watch how you play too, after all. Do you need an awesome beard like yours to play BCR? Everyone I know that started playing Beast Claw has since grown a beard. Checkmate. Although let's be honest, the mustache game is super weak. Mixed Grand Alliances, your take? Um, a necessary option when factions were still waiting on books and has holdovers for random leftovers, but now it feels unnecessary. I'm sure you can do some neat stuff with them, but I haven't paid it any attention since the end of first edition. For new players, pick a battle tome 100%. What army has the most visual variety on the table but is still good? Um, Skaven, Seraphon, Cities of Sigmar all stand out off the top of my head. You said Gutbusters are underdogs and Beast Claw are good, but you didn't differentiate power levels for Orc Warclans. That's because I think all three Orc Warclans are powerful. Bone Splitters is probably the weaker of the three, but don't tell Plastic Crack I said so. To learn the game, is it best to start with Horde or Elite? They teach you different skills, and each can be fun and powerful in their own way. I think you're missing out by not at least trying a friend's army of each type before you commit. It's personality, see which one clicks. How does Corn Mortals win outside of slot machine dice with the hero axe and a sea of bodies? By stealing other armies' foot troops since yours were designed to be way too shitty baseline and an overcompensation for all the buffs that they intend for you to get. Play Marauders basically, so sea of bodies it is. Hope Corn V2.5 finally gets that corn feeling and internal balance right. They also have this weird problem where 40mm base equals shit rules compared to hordes and I don't understand the problem. Are Gutbusters really underdogs? Yes. The category of underdog was designed specifically with Gutbusters in mind as the central definition, and I compared every other army to them when deciding whether those armies qualified. But again, 
doesn't mean bad. Do you consider tabletop TO when researching army statistics? No. The gold standard for compiling tournament stats, such as those from LOV Honest Wargamer or AOS Shorts, is 5 round events minimum, since in rounds 1 and 2 your wins have a high chance of being against 2 really lucky matchups that you're just really good against, and only after pairings start organizing into 3-0, 4-0 do you really start informatively separating. Almost every tabletop TO event is a 3 rounder with only like 20 people, the useful data just isn't there. Even putting aside the differences between in-person AOS and a digital version. It's great to still play the game during COVID, and it's great for testing out some build to see how it acts in a game, but I wouldn't jump to any conclusions, and there aren't nearly enough five-round tournaments to really gauge anything. Why might Night Haunt now? <laughs> Why might Night Haunt be maybe good now? We're going to have to work on your syntax, but I like the passion. Their points went down. I think they benefit from the way battle plans changed in GHB20, and with Realm Artifacts going away, there's a lot less ethereal, and you're special again. Uh, several people asked how Slanesh dropped from arguably the most OP army in the game to what I might call upper underdog. Okay, timeline. Slanesh released with some of the most interesting and fun mechanics for Johnnies we've ever seen since old school corn pops. Problem, they were way too good. So over the winter balance update, they made Locus work on a 5-up for heroes and a 3-up for keepers instead of a 4-up and a 2-up respectively, and increased summoning costs by 50%, which seems like a lot, and it is, but it balanced them against multi-wound armies... It just left them a bit weak against one wound armies. This is largely celebrated as a fine fix. Slanesh was no longer oppressive, and they were still pretty good, so well done. Seems like GW is getting better at balancing, as long as you don't look at any of their other winter balance changes or the long line of things that got no attention. Then GHB20 came out, and their points went up anyway. And we were all like, stop, they're, they're fixed. You, your work was done. They also lost realm artifacts. Summoned units don't count for bonus objective points, and a bunch of shooting armies that destroy them came out or got buffed. So long story short, got nerfed into being balanced, and then quadruple nerfed out of nowhere afterwards for no reason, and so they're weak now. Could it be that they float up to good? Yeah, maybe. They largely lost their ability to simply replace every casualty and more, ending a game having used 3,500 points in a 2k match. You're once again the fast, fragile killer army that's supposed to take chances and get punished when they don't pan out. Your summoning replaces one such bad luck interaction, but not every single one. Keepers are still regal, androgynous, 14-foot-tall, cat-walking, double-caster lawnmowers. You just don't play four of them with 15 total battle line models anymore. I mean, you can. I'm not going to tell you how to live. No Legion of Asgore? For a brand new player guide on picking their first AOS army, I'm just probably not going to mention an all-fine-cast, overpriced, forge-world-only PDF army. Probably irresponsible to do so. AOS Forge World stuff has a tenuous history of support at best. It, look, it's an okay second army luxury item when you know what you're getting into, but I'm keeping it to proper name battle tome stuff for new players. But this is as good a place as any, so... Legion of Asgore. Underdogs, but everyone that plays them tells me they're good. Contemptuous dwarves who sold their souls to chaos in exchange for hell forges, infernal industry, and dark sorcery. Universally despised by every other race, even mindless undead, and the feeling is mutual. Sentient life of the mortal realms are but would-be slaves to the Legion of Asgore. They have black shard armor, which prevents the first wound allocated to each unit, each shooting phase, and each combat phase. Which might seem minor, and it is, but it adds up when the opponent is spreading their attacks around and across phases. Also, when flying enemies move more than six inches around them, they take one mortal wound sometimes. And that's it. If you thought ogres just walked forward and attacked with a lack of game-changing mechanics, who boy. LOA. This is the classic dwarven experience. Four-inch move, no shenanigans. Bonuses when you haven't moved as if it were possible to be any slower. Okay armor and normal attacks. Your iron sworn kick back a mortal wound on sixes to save and sixes to pistol shots. And your fire glaives have medium range underwhelming shooting that also procs a mortal wound on sixes to hit. You have overpriced but okay-ish cavalry, very overpriced but hilarious Kadai Fireborn with flying, ethereal, and tons of rendless attacks that do d3 damage. It can really catch people out if they live long enough to charge. Awesome looking but ultimately not great heroes, though demon smiths are your bread and butter. Finally, you have segmented individual war machine artillery train cars, which is unbelievably badass. I'm not going to tell you what any of them do because I want you to keep that joy that you're feeling right now for as long as you can before it comes crashing down when you read their lukewarm rules. This army needs a proper AOS release with new models and rules so badly that it's tragic. 
Just think of what the modern sculptors could do with chaos, hellfire, train car artillery. It doesn't matter that this army is made by a sister company, or that it's not terribly powerful, or that the average list is well over a thousand dollars, or that a lot of your power comes from allies, or that you can't even buy the Skullcracker and Deathfreaker train cars anymore because the mold broke and they didn't want to replace them. You're the chaos black dwarves that breathe fire and war trains are fucking cool. Alright, there you go. Thanks for all the questions. I hope you like the answers. If you have any more, I stream Mondays on Twitch and we chat AOS the whole time, so thanks for watching.